size is the only thing guarantee that you, we are going to be the main star. So we are the main star of our lives. And if my life would be a book, should be called Sex, Money, and Equations. And be prepared. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. So let's start with the beginning. So I was born in Ipanema, Rio de Janeiro. However, and that is always however in life, when I was very young, in March 1964, my father, a military, was moved from Ipanema to Ipanema, Porto Alegre. It's not the same, not the same. And it's not the same attitude, because March 64 was the military coup. He arrived in the base in which the soldiers, low rank soldiers like himself, took the, the place, put the high handed militaries in prison. We are prepared to fight against Brazil to keep this a democracy. Unfortunately, we lost. Okay, we lost. That's a misfortune. So I grew up, and you can see that mini skirt was in my life very early, <laughs> in a dictatorship. Inside a military village, learning that the communists would take my blood and don't know what they would do with this blood, but we are threatened all the time by this bad bad communists. Uh, I had, the military village have a huge advantage. Instead of doing video games and this kind of inside doors games, I could play outside. And you could see that I already was like uh, uh, showing off from <laughs> early age. Yes, it's always showing off at, at a very early age. That's my school at that time. And you can see that you have a construction. I study all my life in public school. Uh, my mother teach me how to learn before going to the school because the school, school only accept if you have six and a half. And I was born in January, so I entered in the school in July. So she, she taught at home. And when I entered this school, I have a very peculiar thing. If you don't have classes, you have to carry bricks to, to, to the construction. So, it's the only school I know that the students, they want classes badly. <laughs> Please, we need classes. And this is the school today. OK, so I have this very unusual for the time teenager, a lot of adventure. And in the extra time at night, I usually work in the lab of the school because they receive some equipment. And the director invited me, and I could assemble stuff exciting stuff by myself. One day, I have to assemble a brick oven. So I took the brick. You know, we have plenty of bricks in that school. So I took the bricks. I do that. I put the resistance. And I did a mistake. And the whole light, light of the, the school went down. OK? So I run. I disconnect. I run to the, I connect. I did that, that so the this, this smell is gone. And when the teacher came, everything was fixed and perfect. And from that day on, I decided I want to be a scientist. Because scientist is this. You want to do something, you get tension and tension and tension. And then you succeed. And you have this moment of success that's an orgasm. So I want that. I want that badly. I want that badly. <laughs> So I see, I want to be a scientist. So then, when I entered my first day of class, we are 40, we are 80 students, and we have eight girls, OK? 10%. These are we, me, and my study, and these are us today. The only one who is staying in physics was me. All of them are very rich and successful, unlike myself. But <laughs> they give up because of the pressure, the absence. When I entered to the university, I realized two things. The first thing I realized, wow, I am a woman. OK, I was not that stupid, you understand? I knew I was a woman before. But I realized, what carries being a woman? I became a woman, suddenly. I became this minority. Okay. 
And the second thing I realized is that I came from the public system, so I was not the average student. I never went to Europe, or I never had philosophy as to school. My English was very basic. I didn't know the difference between all this you know, Marxist types. I even, I only know that the Marxists, they, tra they drain the blood of the people. The only thing, but I didn't know that they have all this different Trotsky, Lenin, Stalin, Stalin. But I realized soon that even these Marxist people, they didn't give a special or the real place for the woman. The women are doing the low stuff. The guys were doing the speech. I said, this is wrong. So I want to be you know, at the director of the students. I went, you know, I planned myself, the one that didn't know the difference of the Marxism, to be the director of the students' union of the physics. And to do that, I said, I'm going to take, since I don't understand the difference between Marxist, Leninist, Stalinist, and, and, and the Chinese, I pick up one from each and make a group to compete for the position. And we call ourselves, it, it, this word I don't know if in English makes sense, but we call ourselves Frenchy Ampla, open, you know, front. Because we are doing immediately, immediately, the pol you know, the people involved in politics, they got very angry. What's this woman? This, they, they usually make nicknames to me, call me Demo Christian Democrat, because this was so offensive, I didn't realize, I didn't understand also what was a Christian Democrat. A Christian Democrat, this Christian Democrat wants to run. This woman wants to run. So next day, the whole physics institute was with a lot of paperwork with a half-naked woman. The only French ample we accept is this one. Okay, so I won, I won, I won, <laughs> and we, you know, I keep on going, being in the committees, I didn't care, I, I keep on going that, I keep on going to the street, and I've going to the street many times, we succeed to kick out the military, it <clears throat> was hard, was difficult, we succeeded, it was really a complicated time, I have to leave the, my parents' house, because my father suffered a lot with the idea, that I could go to prison, and he couldn't say that I could go to prison. You understand the feeling? He knew, but since he was a military, he couldn't confess that he knew the military torture, da, 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 all that, that. So it was very complicated for him. So I decided to move out home very early. So I became also this girl that lives by herself, <laughs> very sinner. So, but when I finished this, uh, PhD, I was in a moment in Brazil in which you have Embraer, Petrobras, you have all these wonderful things for technology, and we are about to kick out all this military. So I thought, wow, big success. So what happened? I got married with a colleague. Okay, people make mistakes in life. I did my own. <laughs> so I married a colleague. And it was fun, too, because he came from this very wealthy family, so I was the disaster of the disaster of the whole... The whole family united for the first time his family against me, so I was kind of the catalyzer of the whole family. People that didn't speak with each other start to speak because this horrible communist, feminist, oh, terrible. Then master, PhD, and then I found this decision. In life, you, make, you have to make decisions. At that time, if you, when you finish the PhD, pretty much they have a job waiting for you at the university, okay? Your former advisor makes a way, they open a competition, you enter with many other people in the competition, we had a fair chance to get the job. However, if you get a job at that point, you cannot go abroad for at least five years. And I said, no, I want to experience. So instead of doing the normal thing, structured thing, we just decided to go abroad. So we went abroad, we spent two years, and as any couple, we start a fight. You understand? Where we are going. At the beginning, we are trying to find places for both of us, but my former husband was more shy than myself, so it was very difficult for him to find a place in which they could accept him. Okay? So I decided, okay, I give up. You decide 
you go to the place in which your group have contact, and I find myself something because I'm much more flexible uh, because the condensed matter, condensed matter is uh, you do many things, so I go. And I was, second thing, in life you have to have luck. You understand? Luck. Plain vanilla luck. I was lucky. A very important person moved exactly when I was going to University of Maryland, moved there. His name was Michael Fisher. And he knew me because we met once in a meeting and somehow I make an impression on him. So I wrote and he said, yes. So we moved there. So we moved. Again, I was the only woman in the room. And Michael, working with Michael was very interesting because he treat men, women, Latin people, because at that point being a Brazilian was really bad, Latin people in the same way. He treated everybody equally bad. So that would feel me <laughs> very comfortable. You know, he, he didn't only have TOC, you understand? Transtorn Obsessive Compulsion. He invented it. So it's a, he created it. He was the person writing the thing because he was really bananas crazy. But it was very exciting work for a person that was as crazy as myself. So I enjoy it. And at that time, I started to do something new. That was the thing. You have to do something new. And I started to work in a mixture of oil, water, and surfactant. And we developed models for that. It was very exciting. We could discover something about the phase diagram of the system. So I was very exciting with this new thing that was working theoretically with it. This is just to illustrate how few women we were. Coming back to Brazil, I tried to get a job in a different place than the place where I did my undergrad, grad, etc. But it was very strange. I went to the place and said, why are you not coming back to your place? You might have something very wrong on you because they don't want you. So actually, the place want me. Actually, the place want me more, my former husband than myself, because he was from the pedigree, correct pedigree inside the institution. So they opened two positions. We got the positions. And the natural thing at that time in Brazil is that when you go back to the group where your advisor is, you are just part of the group, and you have this boss. If you are lucky, the boss retires at some point, and you become the boss. So that was the finger cross of everybody. <sighs> Has to retire. And I could do that. I could wait, be a good girl. But unfortunately, I'm not a good girl. Not, not, not. So one thing I did is that at some point, I went to my former advisor. I said, Thank you very much for everything you did for me. I'm grateful. I think I paid this gratitude being a couple of years as a professor working in your group. But today, I'm opening my own group. And opened the group in CNPq, and I decided it's my group. Immediately, the institution was like a, a nightmare. Because they want to stop me doing it. There is, and they couldn't find. You know, there's no, no way you can stop someone to decide to, to, to build. So they start to do things. He was the, the, the head of the department. So he would check if I was giving the classes. He would give me the hours classes. All this naughty, stupid thing that people do when they want to threaten you. When I moved, I did something that was very bad for him. I had the majority of the students and I have a very important postdoc in the group. And, and they all come with me. So suddenly, he was a boss of nothing. And that was, he was angry. So he started to, in the whole country to say, me or her. You know, he was top hanked in CNPq. I was low hanked in CNPq. So every time I would go to some place, if he said, what is going on, Marcia? He is angry with you. I said, you would be, be angry with me. You know, I'm a bitch. So I just <laughs> kick him out. But I only, I am this. So accept it or not. And fortunately, we have these external forces, very important to have good external forces. So we have these external forces. We have uh, Michael Fisher help me by pressing. You know, even though we fight all the time, is like fight hate. So Michael was defending me each time he would met a Brazilian and say, no, Marcia is great. OK, so we succeed. And that's the first version of my group. This was my uh, 
postdoc, PhD student, PhD student, and this is the researcher that I could I grab together. That was the reason for, for the more hate possible. We have to keep four years until he got a job, but it was very, very increasingly interesting moment. And that moment, we decided to study uh, how to use, to, to model DNA and surfactant. You remember, I was studying surfactant, DNA surfactant, to make uh, gene therapy, uh, some gene therapy as ideas. This is an experiment that our group did with our phenomenological and calculation. But then happened something. I realized that we are so few women in physics, and here I'm showing the survey conference from 1927, and I'm asked, it's 1927, this is so old, but that's the one for 2011. And I start to realize there is a problem of that, okay? I must but it's only this Europeans bastard. And that's the uh, committee that in 2013 judged all the fellowships, the one Zelia was talking. Can you see? Can you see the error? People say that the error. Also, you can see that I should buy new blouses. But anyway, because <laughs> <laughs> this is 2013. And I see him. I was the, the, chair, the chair of this committee. 20 people, just one woman, no black. All kind of world. The only no ones here, but the other ones kind of world. So we have a problem. We have a problem. And, and we start to discuss gender issues at this point. And I took advantage that I was the chair to ask CNPQ to have this uh, one year of a adding one year to the ones that have kids, the ones that had kids, and I succeed because I was there. So powers matter. You were there. You can go to the boss. You can kick him, okay, many times. I'm not an easy person. You know, he had to give me the money. One time, we spend a week judging, and they come, you know, the president comes with this, no, Marcia, you need to cut in half. I would look, say, where are my flowers? Which flowers? If you are fucking me, you need to give me flowers first. <laughs> and he gave a little bit of more money. So we managed to have some, some things going on. But what's the reason for that? One is the stereotypes. Then there's this maternity versus career. That's something, you understand, if men would have kids, this would be no problem. You would give a medal when you have a kid. Then we have few role models, a few women in, in, in high positions. And this is, you think that this is all, this is, is a cartoon from a study in which they show how the kids perceive scientists. But my Anna, my PhD student, is doing the same. And I was shocked to see that the same stereotypes prevail. All this early, and now, some of her pictures from the Brazilian kids, they have a gun in the lab. You understand? They design a gun in the lab. So it's, it's crazy. Stereotypes are bad because we do not look like that. Just to show an example, the first article I wrote for the Journal de Ciência from Sociedade Brasileira Progresso da Ciência about gender in 2002, they, if, without asking me, they illustrate with this. Come on, I don't, I do not do biology. I don't have a kid, and I even don't know how to cook. So that's not me. You're not wearing a mini skirt, come on. But the problem is not only physics people. We have a general problem with the decrease of women in science in general, and everything in general when increasing the career. So we have Ah, one problem for certain areas in which women don't go, but we have a general problem in which you have to work together to change. That is, the women vanish. They, they disappear at, at, at some point after the PhD, and they might go to some place, some mysterious, I never know where they go. They go to some mysterious place, maybe the same place where the socks that disappear in the washing machine, they go, I don't know, there is a heaven of socks of, and the, the woman that disappeared from that. So what the hell can we do now? I know, this picture is 
fake because a woman is asking what to do. Mm, not realistic at all. Only in the films, honey bunny, that the women are in danger. So what to do? No, the women know how to do. Go to your houses. The kids need to solve something. They run to the mother. Mom, what we are going to do? You did? The women know how, what to do. Okay, okay, I'm being unfair. Once my niece and nephew went to my brother to ask, because they are in despair, they run to him and ask, Dad, where is mom? <laughs> okay, but why should you do that? And that's my new thing. It's not just because it's democratic, it's fair, it's human rights. It's because it's more efficient. Be diversity is more efficient. Diversity is meritocracy. And it's not me saying, it's not our NEG saying, it's McKinsey. McKinsey is a, a company that makes consultant to another companies. So what they did, they looked at 500 biggest companies in the world, and by the way, they call themselves the 500. You understand? The, the, the 500 dot. So when you say the 500, you know that they're 500 companies. So they looked at the 500 companies, and they they put then more gender balance, less gender balance, and they figure out that in three different ways to, to get money, they make more money, the top ones that they, they have more women, they make more money than the ones in, in the bottom, okay? First, I didn't know that there is three different ways to get money. I just have one, my salary, so I said, oh, there are more than ways, maybe they tell me which way I can make more money, but anyway, it's important to realize that more women means more money. And here is not the woman cleaning, being secretary. They only account for women in managing position. Okay? So the companies know, the multinationals know that they need more women in their board of directions as this boss. And they hire companies nowadays to train there. And there is one in Brazil called Mulheres 360 who is a company which works teaching the companies how to have more women. And it's not only my women, it's more diversity, okay, in general. How you do manage to do that. But in science, we're still far behind. Okay, but the question was raised in the year 2000 in the General Assembly, uh, why we have so few women, and it's funny, there was no woman in that meeting, there are so few women in science, so they create this working group on women in physics, in which here is our first meeting, okay? Okay, you can see uh, Judy, you can see all the group, young and beautiful. So, and we are in, yes, we are in the front of White House because we got uh, Beverly work in the White House, so she got a night visit at the White House, Oval Office included. And unfortunately, Bill Clinton was not around because, <laughs> but he was in the trip, so I could not take opportunities to say hello. But anyway, so one thing this group did, instead of doing a study, we did this conference, and it was exciting because it was the first time you could put together 65 countries, more than 300 people, to discuss women. And from there, uh, we have policies, policies for APAP, but policy for other places. We have those groups that start things going on in their country. So it's very exciting time. One thing you figure out that is you have this problem of decrease of the percentage of women when you go from undergrad to professionals. And that's a general thing. In all the regions of the planet, we have the same problem. Better in some place, but always this trendy of decrease. And then comes the funny part, okay? The American Physical Society, they have this prize that's given to people that help the ones in need, deepest need in Latin America, in Africa. So usually professors that leave their fancy labs and go to Africa to teach to these ignorant people or to teach to Latin American people. I got this prize for helping the dumb rich women from the North Hemisphere to get more money, because actually very little after the conference have changed in Latin America, and I mentioned that 
come on, the Indian here got the prize. Né? And you, before it was other way around. Anyway, it was fun. What can you do? One thing you can do is that we have to improve the percentage. And you have to look what the others have done to do that. And here's the percentage of women in PhD, with PhDs in the United States for a long, long period of time. And you can see, OK, that's a big number, but that's a war. And then goes down a second war. Goes, I'm not saying to make a war, OK? <laughs> but then you see a change here. You can say change. There's a change, a change of slope. Change of slope in physics means that you made a force. There is an acceleration in the process. So something is accelerating in the process. And the thing that accelerates in the process, be prepared, I'm sending something strong, is affirmative action. She is going to talk about quota. That was the, you know, it's my magic word when I want people to do something. If you don't do that, I'm going to talk about quota. Because people hate this word quota. And I will explain, affirmative action is much broader than quota. In Brazil, today, we have quota systems for entrance at university. And it's OK, but it's not enough. We need affirmative action that's more general. It's to look in every step of the, the, the career what is going on. It's to make change to provide institutions with change, change of attitude. You know, I always say, quota is one thing. Affirmative action is broader. More or less like sex. You have many ways to do, and the best is to do all the ways all together. But <laughs> that is just a tip. So one thing we did, in Carolina Brito and Daniela Paverni at the University of Federal, you have some Catemari show, is that, Este é meu professor, ok? Sentence, stupid sentence from the professors. And in, the first time they went to the departments, you know, at university, they want to post it. And the people say, no, don't post that. However, I was like, that's important to have someone in post. I was the director of the Physics Institute. And I was considered, another thing important, to be considered the crazy person. So I was the director considered to be the crazy person who has all the emails of the whole university. So I said, dear colleagues, directors, I'm sending a couple of things. I want you to post them. And they immediately post them. So that was important. But the, the, and that more of the sentence. And then I realized that humor is also a very important tool. So one day we are invited, me and Carolina, that's Carolina, that's good looking girl, is Carolina Bito. And me and Carolina we were invited to talk in a bar. So I said, ah, there is no data show in bars. How can you do something? I said, Carolina, let's do a stand up comedy. And we start to build up this story of Carlotta, the girl that wants to be a scientist. The girl talking with the mother. The girl talking with the professor, the girl talking with the co colleague, the girl talking with people. And we construct that using sentence we heard from other people over our lives. You understand? So if I heard something nasty from my colleagues, I put in the sketch. So every time we are together, we do that. We have a film, a little film we did about the, the thing. So it's a fun thing to do. And people, the men usually went, because we go to international, in the study fees we did, we did another conference uh, uh, here, international, in which it was funny to see the colleagues say, you said that, not me, because I say the things, and they are accusing each other of being these bastards. Then, you know, power allows us to have, succeed in this uh, maternity leave, to get the book, to get the, Sandy Pickett to write the story of the pioneers, which didn't have a black woman. And to start this movement, like uh, Fernanda uh, started in the south of Brazil, of uh, to making policies for having the, the kids, the name of the kids in the latches to have, you know, to have kids play child care in conference. So it's, it's, it started movements from other parts. So now it is, it's not me doing anymore. In the beginning, 20 years ago, was, I was feeling isolated alone. But now, it's all these people creating this wonderful thing. But still, 
I was over this path, the only woman in the room. I called the only woman in the room here in the CNPQ. Here when I was vice president of IAPAP. Now it's much better because Silvina, you'll be the new president. And here is this, the Council of Science and Technology, 30 people, three women. You can see someone's standing up in the back, but they are the secretaries. And every time I have to tell the minister, is this a boy club? We need more women. So every time we have to standing up and complain about that. Then I start to work with something fascinating for me that was water, okay? And anomalies of water, strange thing of water, doing simulations of this material. And you figure out how water moves faster when you compress, becomes more dense, like a traffic jam, like people walking here in the metro, and would walk faster if you have even more people. So we, our water does that. So we figure out the mechanism, and it's beautiful, because water does that by making hydrogen bonds with the neighbors. You understand? Grabbing. It grabs like in a dance. It grabs and rotates. It's really like a dance. It does like that, that, that. And it does that because when you compress, you have more neighbors to do that. Understand? You pack. Usually, water has four neighbors because it can do four hydrogen bonds. But if you compress, you have six neighbors. You can do bonds, sharing bonds. You know, this kind, <laughs> new type of relationships like uh, poly love. You know, so water does poly love. You know, they didn't want me to call all those kind of the phenomena. You know, sometimes scientists are boring. That's my group nowadays. He, he's not my group. He's my, my life companion. But the other are members of my group in 2006. Then I become the director. And I said, wow, I can become a different type of director that in the Christmas becomes Santa Claus and can become anything and can do all crazy things and can scary the old guy. That's the was the president of it, my vice president, and that was the manager of CAPES, and they all threatened what the hell Marx is going to say this time in the speech. Then I give the stat, and that for my research in water was important, I had in CERN, and it's fun. Then I went to this wonderful institute, Perimeters Institute, they have some correlations here. It's a fascinating place to be, so I, I was there, was minus 30 in Canada, and I said, nobody's coming. Minus 30, I don't leave my bed if I don't have with minus 30. But, you know, the, food was, the, the room was full, was very exciting. So we did a lot of outreach in our university. We do one day a year, we go out to teach. We go to the bookstores and you teach. You go to the streets. This is when the students took over the university. Um, I decided to teach outside some things, so we have a lot of teaching outside. And this is when, okay, I, I, I'm not a teenager anymore, but to see, I, I cannot be out of the streets. I love to go to the streets, and that's one of the days we went out to the streets to complain about the cuts of funds. I managed to, to kidnap the president of the university, and he was in my side, running through the cars and screaming, and was very, you know, old people thinking they're young. Again, my, ah, that was fascinating. I did an advertisement for a company. You know, they went, that was fun. So that's my new thing about water. We also study how water flows fast when it's nano confined. I also have nano thing, and I have graphene in my things. So <laughs> when water is nano confined, what happens is that the speed in which it confines can be a thousand times. Uh, speeder than should if the equations work in nano. So people don't understand why. And one of the clues is that water goes like an onion. It it's doesn't occupy all the space. It's, it's making lines, and in these lines, they flow fast. More or less like in the metro, if you want the people to get inside the metro faster, you should have a line. So they should copy water to plan the metros, but they didn't. But anyway, she flows very fast. Actually, our kidney uses this mechanism. For these findings, I got the L'Oreal Prize. And that was a change of game, because I got huge visibility inside Brazil and outside. And in Brazil, I use that as a strong weapon. Each time they call me, oh, Marcia, so you got the prize for what? Yes, but by the way, you have a problem with human. But by the way, I have. So I included the topic 
strongly on that. And in my speech at UNESCO, I compared getting a prize and making a discovery with an orgasm at Sorbonne. And for that, I was the, you know, as whole page of one of the French newspapers. They love when you talk about sex, the French people like, so it was fun. <laughs> then I got other types of, this is the Claudia Prize. And it was funny because I was wearing a mini skirt that's not showing here. And they were discussing before the prize, what she, because usually in Brazil, if you want to look elegant, you have to use a, uh, what she's been you going to use? Actually, you can see that's the same dress of the Lori. I always have, you know, I need to shop more frequently. This is, then something happened. I got this prize that gave lots of visibility. And it was the first time that the Brazilian that was not in the Academy of Science got the prize. So the Academy had to elect. It was like, oh, uh, we, these women have to get in. And that's me with my good friend, Elena Nader, okay, getting, this, uh, getting into the academy. And then trouble starts because I decide to look at that academy. And that's the percentage of women in the academy in all fields. And you can see the top is, is biological physics, that's 25%. And nowadays in bio, you are 60% of women in the room. Here is two engineers. We are five physicists. You know, I see a small table in a restaurant. You understand? No need to do a meeting, a small table in a restaurant. So we are alone, alone in this group. And I remember the first meeting I went, our magna meeting, there was no woman speaking. And I went to the president and said, what a pity that no woman accepted your invitation to be a speaker here. <laughs> now we have half and, you know, half and half, so he's being careful. So I got... I got some prize from my university, and I managed to make my university to sign before she of UN. So now we have to obey UN rules. And that's been a fight, but okay, we manage it. They know I have the email data bank of the university. That's quite a powerful thing to have. And we are doing now uh, a survey about uh, sexual and moral harassment inside university. Okay? And that's covered by that. So the, the, because if you, I do that as myself, Marcia, as some attempts have been made in UFRJ, other professors sue the person doing. But now the, you know, the, the lawyer of the university is covering my back for doing the questionnaire and posting the answer of this questionnaire. So we are kind of safe. <laughs> then because of my thing in general, you know, I got this Capis Prize and it was so funny because the Minister of Education, not this one, that's horrible, but the previous one that's just bad, uh, <laughs> was there. And that's the president, this is a very close friend of mine, is from president of Capis. And it was like uh, he, you know, the minister would give the prize, then the president of Capis, and then someone else, and return. So it was supposed to be the minister. Abilio just jumped it because he didn't want me to do some tricky things with the minister. So he got, <laughs> I do tricky things. So I said, no, no, I, I love Marcia. I'm going to give the prize to Marcia. So I end up getting this prize. And then during the Temer, Nobody's perfect, the American government. Uh, I was honored with this medal of scientific and etc. And it was a tricky time about government, so they, I decided to go in red to make a little <laughs> statement about what I think about. And, and everybody was feeling a kind of uneasy about that. And that's my group today, last year actually. And they are for all parts of the country. And it has been a really interesting uh, trip working with that. And nowadays, we, what we are doing is to use graphene and disulfate molybdenum to clean water, to desalinate water. And that's some design of our simulations, as well as understand the, how water changes different proteins in DNA. Uh, that are my students for the other program. They were not in the previous. So I, I advise in two programs, in physics and in physical education. 
So here, Mayara, Roberta, and Carolina, the students are workers of the CAPES agency. So I have now my agents to get the data. So they get me fresh data so we can do a lot of fun. And I, we have been looking uh, also to how the uh, open access impact, the impact of women, how the CAPIS and other agencies, they have the same scissor effect as everything else. And over my path, I became this live comic cartoon because people have doing cartoon I find very funny. And I even became a paper. That was what paper wrote about me. I found that so old. I feel so ancient. And this program here was Maria Vaipazotas, a podcast. The topic of the podcast was old women. <laughs> no. But it was fun. It was fun. Anyway, if I want to give you a message, the message that alone we cannot win this fight. And it is a fight. But together we can. And it's been, you know, we went far, so the force, third Newton law, is pushing us back, so we need to push back again. And we need to go together, and we need to include all fights. It's not that because in Brazil the majority of women are white that we have to know. It's not because people say the trans are not women that you should not include their fight. We have to be different from them. We have to isolate the ones that don't believe in diversity. And the only do way to do that is to be inclusive. So together, men and women, we can go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcia, for the very inspiring talk. So. If there are any questions. Hi, Marcia. First of all, thank you for around the world. Thank you. <laughs> and I think you said something that is very important. Uh, women who are winning those kind of prizes, they are now very important to us individually and as a community of uh, scientists and women and so ever, we cannot afford not doing politics anymore. So I think it's very important for each one of us who is in this room, like you do, like other women do. Once we won any prize or something like this, we have uh, to make a commitment to our community to do politics and to talk about our questions, our demands, as you do. It's, mm -hmm. I think it's not fair with us and with the people who came before us and we will come after us. And like Zelia said today, it's not fair to his mother who was working to our pioneers, mm -hmm. not doing politics when we win those prizes. We have to take the every room they give us or all these awardees to talk about these questions to enlighten the problems and to show the way and that's mm -hmm. why I, I thank you for doing that. Yeah. It, you're correct. I always say, you know that the concept of glass ceiling, yeah, that you know the woman have a top, can see the top but they are not reaching the top because they have this glass ceiling. So the woman that break the glass ceilings. They always have a woman whipping the floor, collecting the pieces of glass. And you should understand, profoundly understand that. And work f for everybody too. So it comes, if you, each time you go a step forward, means you get more responsibility to the diversity issue. Uh, it's uh, a very inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Marcia, I wonder if uh, other women, colleagues of yours at the university and uh, in all walks of life who are also scientists, um, I, I bet not everyone is engaged with 
this um, sort of conversation. So I wonder, how do you uh, engage women who don't want to see as victims, who don't want to be victimized, and they don't want to look like uh, they're weak before their peers, you know, their male peers. So they don't want to talk about gender issues. Uh, so how do you... How do you do that? How do you engage them? Or there is no way to engage them? Okay, let's tell my story. Um, Carolina Brito, that has Meninas na Ciência, has um, uh, some videos called The Place of Women, okay? And in these videos, she first interview all the senior professors of our university, female professors. And none of them, excluding myself and an astronomy physicist of our department, thought that there is a problem. They ignored the problem, okay? Then she started to, to interview the youngest professors. And they all identified that there is a problem. So first we have a, we have a problem that women that succeed get to the top. They have to ignore the problem to succeed, okay? So they play, they close their eyes, and they do ignore a problem. So what's my, and they ignore, they say, Marcia, I never had a problem, I don't see, I disagree with you, blah, blah, blah. Usually I say, I don't have an opinion, I have data. You don't have, good for you, okay? Good for, I don't push them, you're stupid, blah, 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 blah. because I saw that happening in different meetings in which they are pushed back, and they never return. But I say, look to the numbers, look to the neighbors, look to the evidences. Maybe you are lucky. It was not true, because when I start to, to show things, what I call men's interrupting, men's disbanded, they start to also recognize that they're, in their own lives they suffer that. And then you have a champion in yourself. It's a long, long way work, but the good news is that the youngest ones are coming better. Okay? So we need to be together. You don't need to be stupid. You don't know anything. No. You just say, well, maybe you didn't face, you know, any harassment, you know, but good for you. Yeah? But look to the numbers. Because there is one dangerous thing. One day we are in this meeting with all international L'Oreal winners. And I might say, the two understand that there's a problem. And, and so, two physicists actually. And then I put a question. Tell me what do you think a woman needed to succeed. And they gave us list, unbelievable list. You have to be outspoken. You have to be secure. You have to be this and this. So, oh, I know many men that succeed, and they don't have. I have a you know astronomer in our department. That's it's basically uh, not autist, but I think he's bipolar. <laughs> he's medicated bipolar. He never travels. And he is one of the more sightest astronomers of the country. And he cannot speak, he cannot teach, because he goes to the corner and he stays like that, and the students start to throw papers on him. Oh. You know. And this person succeeds. So if a woman would be like that, we never succeed. So I say, you see, you are creating one very specific type of women that succeed. And this is not diversity, and this is no good. It's very specific. It's the one outspoken that speak, that survive, that don't care, that don't care when they say this and this and that. And this is bad for science. And then these women start to think about the problem. So we need to make intelligent people that believe in evidence to think about the problem. But I'm only talk about people that accept evidence. Because on the way, I found many people Women and men, they did not accept evidence. Even scientists that don't accept evidence. For them, I have just one thing, is my magic weapon, that's this. <laughs> Works for both men and women. You know, for women, you have to be a little bit, maybe, upper or stronger, <laughs> okay? But for men, it's magic. It's once, and they never bother you again. Any more questions? Okay, if there are no any thank more you. questions, we thank Marcia again. Uh,
Um, so now we have a coffee break. I remind you that those people who had their posters exhibited yesterday, they should remove the